temptations on every hand Though Satan's tried to stop me And to place my feet on sinking sand Through the pain and all of my sorrows Through the tears and all of To keep me for he's kept me in the midst of it all Not because I've been so faithful Not because I've always obeyed
Mm-hmm. Happy Sunday morning, Abyssinian Missionary Baptist Church. Uh, this is Reverend Frank, and I'm here to actually welcome you to our virtual service. It's so great and good to see all of you. Uh, if you haven't, we are asking right now that you share this video with all of your friends, uh, your kin folks, uh, your best friend, your work friends, or whoever else will listen to you. Uh, this is our way of actually getting this wonderful, this great and mighty word out to people. Uh, we are in, I think, the third week of a new sermon series, uh, Advent Economics. And I'm going to tell y'all right now, Pastor Earl has been killing this. He is just loading all of this great wealth of information on us. And it has really been a blessing. And we hope that it's been a blessing to you. So I'm going to open up um, our service with prayer. But first, I actually want to read a scripture that was laid on me this morning. Um, It's Psalm 37 and 28. Indeed, the Lord loves justice, and he will not abandon his godly ones. They are kept safe forever, but the lawless will be chased away, and the descendants of the wicked will be cut off. Just wanted to offer that scripture up as encouragement uh, as we deal with what we're dealing with. Um, I just, sometimes it gets a little dark, sometimes it gets a little hopeless because it does seem like we are fighting not just one Goliath, but several at one time. But just know that God has not abandoned us. Just know that even as we look around at what we see as the country going into utter chaos, God is working. It hit me this morning to where God showed me. God was like, it seems like I'm not working, but I'm breaking the back of this system that has oppressed our people for well over 400 years. And not only just us in this country, but around the world. And so God was telling me this morning that it seems like chaos and it is chaotic, but God says I'm working. We say this scripture all the time about how God does things in decency and in order. But what we fail to realize is that what God considers decent and in order is not what we consider decency and in order. So even as we look around at this world right now, at this system that just seems to be just falling apart, know that God is working. God is breaking the back of this system. God is breaking the power that it has, not over, or not only on this country, but all countries around the world. So just hold tight, just hold fast to God's unchanging hand. Let's go to God in prayer. God, we just wanna thank you right now because you yet have control of what we see. God, you yet have your hand on us and your hand on this world. And God, it seems like everything is falling apart but you are showing us that you are breaking this system. You have heard the prayers of the righteous through the generations. You have heard the prayers of your children, God. And Lord, you are moving in this world. And Lord, I pray for each and every person right now that hears the sound of my voice. Be encouraged. It's all right if you feel tired. And God even says it's all right for you to get your rest. But stay, but stay with God. Stay encouraged, push on as you need to, because God is not going to leave you by yourself. And Lord, we pray right now for Earl. Lord, we pray, we pray for Lady Denise right now, the sacrifices that they have given to bring your message, God. Lord, continue to be with them, Lord. Continue to strengthen them, Lord. Lord, you are giving out a mighty word through Pastor Earl. Lord, you are giving out mighty righteous work through uh, Lady Denise. And Lord, that is coming down to us, Lord, as we take up our crosses, Lord, and as we bear our responsibilities, those responsibilities that you have called us, God, that you have called us to. And Lord, we hope that this message is encouraging to each and every person that hears it. And Lord, if they, God, let's let people know that they are not by themselves. If they feel overwhelmed, if they feel like they're about to go out, Lord, it's all right. Let them know that they can reach out to any one of us. They can reach out to their friends, to their family, but God, they can reach out to you. And Lord, again, we hope that this message blesses each and every person that hears it today. And God, we know that you are yet in control. These things and these promises we know because you have made them to us through your son, Jesus, the black Messiah. Amen and amen. 
All right, again, so if you haven't shared this service right now, please do it. If you set up a watch party, uh, if you just emailed the link through Messenger, through your email to people that you know needs to hear a good word from God this morning, we're asking you to do that. And so what we're going to move to right now is we... Uh, actually, we'll quote our mission and vision statement. We're going to have a good uh, member of Abyssinian to come and actually tell you what that vision and mission statement is. And we say these things to ourselves every Sunday to remind ourselves of who we are and what we're supposed to look like as we are doing this work. Abyssinian Missionary Baptist Church is a positive, progressive, and prophetic Baptist church where the liberating gospel of Jesus Christ is engaged with head hand and heart. Our mission is to be a congregation that actively lives out our faith in efforts to achieve spiritual empowerment, emotional stability, financial responsibility, and physical well-being. Our vision is a, as a gifted, innovative, inspired, and informed congregational network of friends and kin who live out our faith in such a way that we become one of God's tools to redeem those who are without faith in God, reclaim those who have withdrawn from the Black Church, and rejuvenate those who maintain faith in the Black Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth. All right, thank you for the reading of our vision and mission statements. Uh, and as we move on now, uh, we want to offer you all of our ways that you can actually give. Uh, we have done a lot in our sanctuary, so some of you that have not seen the sanctuary as of yet, uh, I think you're going to be pleasantly surprised when you come back uh, on watch night, because we will be back in the sanctuary on watch night, you know, the last day of this month. Yeah, we will be back in the church. Uh, so we're going to open up our ways to give, and we have actually even improved that. So you can uh, hit us with the cash app. Uh, that's at ABC Ministries and the number one. And of course, you put the dollar sign up front. So, but we all know that. But for those that don't, uh, we want to put a dollar sign and then ABC Ministries and the number one. That is our cash app. Uh, then we're going to go to the classic, the PayPal way of giving. Uh, and of course, you can just use the uh, church email address uh, to find us. Uh, that's going to be ABC Ministries, the number one at gmail.com. Uh, then we're going to go to Giblify. I don't know that much about Giblify, so I don't think I've ever used that before. But you can just key in the church name, Abyssinian Missionary Baptist Church. And you should be able to find one of those good pictures of our good pastor, Reverend Earl Fisher. I think he's doing a pastor pose or, you know, whatever that is. But, you know, hey, it's another option. And, of course, our classic way, the good old way, the, smell, the snail mail way. I don't like to say snail mail because... I think that the post office does a wonderful job. And of course, like I, I think I told y'all before, my daddy uh, retired from the post office. So I got a lot of love for the post office. Um, but that uh, address is P.O. Box 9715, Memphis, Tennessee, 38190. All right. So as we continue on, um, we're going to get through this next musical selection. And I think the next voice that you will hear after that is the voice of our pastor, the Reverend Dr. Earl Fisher. Uh, he's going to, again, bring this mighty word that we know is going to have a positive impact on your life right now. So um, after you hear this musical selection, the next voice you're going to be uh, that you're actually going to hear and the next face that you're going to see is that of Reverend uh, Dr. Fisher, uh, our pastor. Fastened in the windows pin Keep your hand on that plow Hold on Noah said you done lost your track Can't plow straight and keep a looking back Keep your hand on that plow and hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. keep your hand on that plow and hold on.
golden chain Every link spell with Jesus' name Keep your hand on that plow and hold on Oh, that chain and never tire Every round goes higher and higher Keep And hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Keep your hand on that plow and hold on. To heaven, now turn you Keep your hand on that gospel plow. Keep your hand on that plow. Just hold on. Hold that chain and never tire. Every round goes higher. Just hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Keep your hand on that plow. Keep your hand on that plow. Today, we ask that you would, in a very unique and direct and profound way, breathe on this stream and on the duration of the service, such that we can capture that miraculous thing that you are doing in our midst and ensure its manifestation. In the name of the Black Messiah, Jesus the Christ, we pray. All of God's people typed and said together, Ashe and Amen. Let me thank Reverend Frank for leading us in worship up to this point. And let me also make a pitch to the Abyssinians this morning. The leadership team and I met earlier this week, and Pastor Josh had a great idea that we have been all trying to sift through to figure out the best way to bring it to pass. Uh, I'm curious if any of you would be willing to sign up for a sermon talk back session with Pastor Josh or somebody from the ministry team where we can review some of the main points in the sermon and discuss those things that have been confirmed in our spirit, but also talk some about those things that we might have found to be controversial or things that we might want to contest because we didn't necessarily agree with that the preacher said or 
especially those things that we are curious about, that God might be saying and doing over the next few weeks, despite whatever sermon series or theme that we're in. If you're interested in something like that, I mean 10 to 15, maybe 15 to 20, maybe 20, no more than 30 minutes after a service, we would set up a time for people to Zoom. We would record these things and we would actually play them in the, in the following Sunday services at the offset to kind of set the stage for what we anticipate God to do. It'll help to preach. I feel like it'll help us wear together all of these wonderful things that God is doing at Abyssinia. So I wanted to make that pitch to us. So why don't you say something in the comment section, tag me or Pastor Josh or one of the preachers or Denise or Gail, somebody from the leadership team, tag us and let us know that you're interested in it. You might not be able to do it today after service, but you can best well believe in the next few services we'll be doing it. But to the point of trying to weave together all that God has been saying and doing in our midst, I want to again call our attention to the book of Matthew in the first chapter as we try to conclude this particular sermon sub-series as we are in the series Advent Economics about powerful and faith-filled giving, still in this theme of empowerment through philanthropic efforts and the power to give right. We spent the last few weeks talking about a sermon entitled The Price of Fulfilled, The Price of a Fulfilled Prophecy. I wanna preach part three, what I believe to be the conclusion of this particular matter, The Price of a Fulfilled Prophecy. Again, we're looking at Matthew chapter one, verses 18 through 24. We spent the last two weeks really digging into some of these preceding verses or the verses on the top part of this particular pericope but I hope to land at the last verse today of God says the same verse 18 says this is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about his mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph but before they came together she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit uh-huh I'm just playing verse 19 because Joseph her husband was faithful to the law type that faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace. He was looking out for this sister whom he allegedly loved. He had in mind to divorce her quietly. I guess he was going to put her in the friend zone. He had in mind to, to divorce her quietly. But verse 20 says, after he considered this, an angel of the Lord, and I want y'all to type this, appeared to him in a dream. Type that, in a dream. I'll pick that up in a little while. And the angel of the Lord who appeared to him in a dream said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife because what is conceived in her, what God is doing in her and in you is from the Holy Spirit. Verse 21 says, she will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus. I wish I had time because he will save his people from their sins. And verse 22 is where we kind of anchored last week. It says, all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, Emmanuel, which means God with us. Verse 24 is where I hope and pray we can hang our homiletical hat this Sunday. Last Sunday before Christmas. Verse 24 says, when Joseph woke up, church folk don't know when to shout, you should be shouting all over the screen right there. When Joseph woke up, type woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him. I want to try it again this last week. I'll do a little review before we press play, but I want to preach part three of the price of a fulfilled prophecy. The price of a fulfilled prophecy. Type speak, Lord, we're listening. I say in a man. You should know by now if you've caught the first two episodes of this sermon that I'm distinguishing and differentiating between what we have come to know as the Christmas season and what we should know as the Advent season. Type that in the comment section, Advent. The Advent season, I told you before, which our consumer and capitalistic culture conditions us to reflect upon and engage in from a commercial standpoint, not as the Advent season, but as the Christmas season 
This season that we are in, the season that we are beginning to conclude, the season that technically started from a commercial standpoint, not even the day after Thanksgiving, I mean the evening of Thanksgiving, before some of us could even finish digesting our Thanksgiving meals with our family. We were enthralled with the desire to try to engage in the capitalistic and consumeristic endeavor of Christmas, the Christmas season. Instead of the Advent season, which is about waiting on a mighty, miraculous, and dare I even say militant move of God, we have been conditioned to engage in the Christmas season. See, Christmas is centered on presence, but Advent is centered on patience. Can I be clear? Because I know as some of us view this sermonic presentation on the stream right now, if you look over to your left or to your right into your living room, some of you in other spaces of your home or your apartment or your dwelling place, if you look underneath a tree, if you have one, a pine tree or a plastic tree that looks like a pine tree, you probably have some presents underneath the tree. And I want to be clear, brothers, sisters, friends, and kin, I am not condemning those of us who have purchased presents as an act of love or gratitude and affection for our loved ones during this holiday season. Don't misquote me and don't lie on me in the public or on social media. I, I ain't really knocking that. I ain't really messed up about us expressing our love to our loved ones through the exchanging or the purchase of gifts. But what I am suggesting today, what I have been trying to suggest in these first two sermon episodes is that the spirit of what was happening 2,000 years ago that gives rise to Advent was about something other than gifts under pine trees. I can't see nobody typing at me. In fact, brothers and sisters, friends, and kin, where Jesus and his people were geographically over 2,000 years ago, there were no pine trees. Teach, Earl Fisher. The origins of this season, Advent, not the Christmas season, that, that is more contemporary because it's more consumeristic. It's more capitalistic. It's more concerned about how major corporations can make more money. You do know that's why we call the Friday after Thanksgiving Black Friday. It's not because that's the day that he died on a hill called Calvary. That is also referred to by some as Black Friday. But in this particular season, Black Friday is the Friday where corporations bank on the fact that Negroes and other ethnic groups are going to spend so much money for Christmas that it would make them go as a corporation from red, which is an economic deficit, into black, which is an economic profit. That's why they call it Black Friday. And I'm suggesting that Advent is rooted and centered on patience, not capitalistic presence, because 2,000 years ago, the people of God had been waiting patiently on the mighty, miraculous, and even militant move of God. They had been waiting on this mighty, miraculous, and militant move of God because there was a prophetic promise, which we would call a prophecy. There was a prophetic promise made to their people. Type at me, somebody. Uh, the, the people of God had been waiting for God to move like only God can move because God had gave words to prophets that God would rise up and the prophets would suggest to God's people, despite our social and political and even theological condition, situation and circumstance, we serve a God that will step in. A God that will show out, a God that will show up, a God that will intervene, a God that will break 
through and change our situation and condition. Not just a God that's going to give us some stuff, but a God that cares enough to change our situation. I ain't mad about us viewing God as a God that also gives us some stuff. Did y'all catch that like I pitched it? I put also in there, which is to say God's primary function is not rooted in our financial or economic surplus. That's not what the model press says. The model prayer does not say, give us this day all of the money in the world. The, the, the model prayer does not say, give us this day enough to buy extra this and extra that. No, my brother, sisters, friends, and kin, that prayer that we pray unto God in our tradition that we refer to as the model prayer. Y'all know what I'm talking about. The Lord's prayer, the Lord's prayer. That is a prayer that says, give us this day enough of what we need. Give us this day our daily bread. God is not just a God that gives us some stuff. God is a God that gives us enough stuff to sustain us such that we can live through the changing of our situation. God's words through God's prophet foretold of a changing of their situation and circumstance and condition and climate. The coming of God, a breaking through of God. God breaking through so that the people could be broken out of their condition. The making of a liberating way for God's people. This was the prophecy type prophecy. This prophecy was given in a social and political climate of exploitation and degradation. Sound familiar? Black folks in Memphis, Tennessee, and black folks all around our yet to be United States of America. This prophecy was given to a group of people who existed for far too long in a social and political climate of deprivation. They were black Hebrews in a white Roman world. These were impoverished people whose labor had been exploited. When the last time you look at all them taxes taken out of your check and think about the number of taxes you pay versus the number of taxes corporations who were banking on your dollars on Black Friday, how much they pay. I wish I had time, but I don't because I need to get somewhere. These were a diasporic and scattered people. Sound familiar? These were people who were relegated and segregated into communities of social and political inequity and injustice, but they were given a prophetic promise, something that they believed in so much that they found a way to wait on God. They were patiently waiting because they were given a prophetic promise that God would show. I, I think I'm at somebody's internal address, ain't I? Because you know what it's like to have seen or heard about the move of God and had been waiting for God to show up. That's what Advent ought to remind us of and recall to us. Advent represents the season of waiting for God to fulfill God's prophetic promise. But I've told you before, one of my primary pivot points or foundational premises in this pastoral summation on this particular scripture is that when God shows up to the patient but expectant people of God, those of us who have been suffering degradation, those of us who know something about exploitation, those of us who have had too intimate of an experience with deprivation, the fulfillment of God's prophecy still, type still, it still requires an investment of the people's time, talent, and treasure. I, I know this ain't what the prosperity gospel teaches us. It, it teaches us that, that, that God loves us so much that God is just going to drop it all in our lap. That, that, that all you got to do is sow your seed and get your breakthrough. Barely. Or, or show up every now and then. Or just pray this seven-step prayer of prosperity. And all of a sudden, no, brothers, sisters, friends, and kin. Part of what I've been trying to describe in the foundation of this faith Field sermonic presentation is that when God's prophecy shows up, God's prophecy still requires a realistic and righteous and maybe even revolutionary investment in God's people's time, talent, and treasure. And maybe, just maybe, can I say it again? May I, may I pull up to your address and honk my Holy Ghost horn? Maybe some of us have been sitting too idle. We've been too still. We've been too indifferent. We've been too detached. We've been too uninvolved. We've been too inconsistent and some of us are so spiritually arrogant and immature We've been too entitled to encounter the will of God 
for our lives and for this world. Maybe the reason the will of God has not been made manifested in our lives, maybe the reason we have not experienced our breakthrough yet, maybe the reason the promises of God that we have heard about or read about that our elders and ancestors shout about and sing about and wrote about, reminding us of who we are and who we can be. Maybe, maybe these things have not become concrete realities for you and me because we failed to pay the price to fulfill the prophecy. Notice, can I say this again just for distinction sake? I'm not saying you pay for the prophecy. That's called pimping the gospel, preach Earl Fisher. I'm not saying that God's prophecy, God's prophetic promises are what cost you and me. No, those prophetic promises are free. But even though God sends them freely and we have direct access to God to obtain them. There is still a price that we have to pay for the fulfillment of that prophecy. So, so that's why I've been asking during this Advent season, what have you paid for real? Not, not what have you stunted like you've paid towards the fulfillment of God's promises. Not, not what you have uh, 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 presented as your uh, uh, public facing pious persona of your relationship with God and your commitment to the things and the will of God. What have you paid? What is your price tag for the fulfillment of God's prophetic promise? I know God has made us a promise. I know God made you a promise and God made me a promise. I know we want the promises of God to be fulfilled, but what have we paid to bring it to fulfillment? Oh, I feel something. Come here, I feel a hip hop Holy Ghost moment coming over me. Y'all, y'all remember uh, 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 that song that Outkast and Goody Mob did is coming to mind for me right now. Y- y- y'all remember CeeLo Green and Outkast and Goody Mob's song that, that was called Get Up, Get Out, and Get Something? Y- y'all remember CeeLo C- said, uh, 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 I-, I-, I admit uh, I've done some dumb ish and I'm probably gonna do some old uh, you shouldn't hold that against me no, though he said why not watch this my music's all that I got then he said what most of us don't want to live into he said but some time must be invested for this to be manifested can I ask you how much time have you put in to the manifestation of God's prophetic promise how much talent have you put in to the fulfillment of God's prophetic promise how much treasure have we put in to it, some time, some talent, some treasure must be invested for it to be manifested. In other words, there's some patience that is, that is involved with the prophetic promises of God because in order for that promise to be fulfilled, I feel like preaching for a second, in order for that promise to be fulfilled, we got to invest some time, invest, type it, invest some talent, invest some tre- How much have you invested? Oh, yeah, yeah, if we want God to break through and to break out and to break into our situation and circumstances, there is a price point that has to be paid. I could stay there for a long time, but I'm trying to get to the real point, the pivot point in this third installment of this sermonic episode. Some of us are sitting in a season of stagnation because we refuse to pay the price that God has assigned to the fulfillment of the promise. When God issues the promise, God has a price tag along with it, and some of us are so audacious, we believe God owes us something, so God God has all of the work and the responsibility. The devil is a liar. I'm talking to those of us who have the audacity and the desire to be spiritually mature enough to own our role and responsibility in the revolutionary actions of God in our lives, which means we have to invest. Somebody just type preach Earl Fisher. I know some of us won't do it because we don't think it's worth it. Uh Uh-huh, that brings me back to my primary preaching assignment for this sermonic installment. Here it is. This is the last time I'm going to go through it because I think this is all God has given me to say this time. I'm preaching this sermon to encourage us to consider that whatsoever, whatever, whatever the price we have to pay for the fulfillment of God's prophetic promises, hear me clearly, Abyssinian, brothers, sisters, friends, and kin, it is worth it. It's worth it. I don't care how much it costs. 
I don't care how much time. I don't care how much talent. I don't care how much treasure. Not like I don't care in a dismissive, in a dismissive fashion. I'm suggesting there is no amount of a price that you and I would have to pay that would not be worth the fulfillment of God's promise. I've spent a few weeks trying to tiptoe through the tulips of this text to teach us how God's people waited and negotiated to embrace and fulfill the divine and prophetic promise. I told you that Joseph negotiated the price point of the prophetic promise. I, I told you that the people were waiting on God. And that God shows up to God's people. That, that, that makes me want to shout out my own shoes. I mean, ain't that some mighty good news? God, God does show up to God's people. Somebody knows what I'm talking about. But, but, but God, when God shows up, God does not overcompensate for work that the people must do or the investments the people must make towards their own freedom. God does not show up and snap God's fingers and solve all of God's people's promise. Preach, Earl Fisher. God does not simply tell God's people to pray about it and it will go away. No, God, watch this, orchestrates a process type process, a process that includes black women and black men, a process that includes black folks and impacts the entire black community. Can I do a sidebar right quick? Ooh, 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 I feel something in my Ebo shots. I notice God shows up to Mary and Joseph, but it ain't just about Mary and Joseph. I, I know we want it to be so individualistic that it's all about me and my, no, when God, yes, Lord, shows up to do God's mighty, God's miraculous, and God's militant work. It ain't never just about you, or as Geno Gibson would say, God never blesses us with just us in mind. In other words, brothers and sisters, God shows up to us so that we can be a blessing to other people because God is at work in and through us. God orchestrates a process that blesses the entire community. How is it God if it just blesses you? See, this is a process. I know we don't like to talk about the process. It's, it's supposed to be God does it suddenly. I'm supposed to tell you all you got to do, it, it, you know, just in just in just a little while. No, it might take a process. Um, yeah, I do know uh, uh, this is a, a pericope about what some would consider to be an immaculate conception, which involves a pregnancy. Uh, you do know pregnancies don't happen instantaneously. Uh, you do know children are not birthed uh, through the pregnancy process until after several weeks. I can't see nobody talking at me. In fact, I'm about to help somebody and I'm about to shout out my own shoes. See, this is why it's important to negotiate the price tag because if you mess around and try to sell it too cheap, you might end up giving birth to what you thought was a prophetic promise of God that was premature. And thanks be unto God, God is kind enough and gracious enough and sovereign enough to, in to allow some premature children to come to full maturity but sometimes it's too dangerous to have it happen prematurely. Patience, type patience. Patience with a process that will take that will take in this pericopean passage at least nine months to nurture and some decades to develop. And when God shows up to Joseph and Mary, they have to negotiate the price point of the prophetic promise. They, they have to decide how much they're willing to pay. The text says. That Joseph is faithful to the Hebrew and Jewish laws which require him to publicly humiliate and maybe even stone his baby girl, his boo thing, his fiance, the one who was found to be with child before she was married. I, I ain't got enough time. Go back and see installment one or two in this sermon series where I dealt with that in a little bit more detail. But Joseph in this particular passage, what I want to highlight is Joseph senses that God might be up to something. Help me, Holy Ghost. Joseph has to reflect upon the possibility of God 
doing something miraculously that involves him and in some ways will make him have to pay a substantial amount of his time, his talent, and his treasure just to see it made manifest and come to fruition. Who am I preaching to? Yes, I'm preaching to you. See, what blesses me about this is that Joseph knows the law. I told y'all about that last week. I ain't got time to dig into it. I told you he knows the law. He's familiar with the law, but he's also willing to consider that God, watch this, might be moving beyond the conventions of the law. Preach, Earl Fisher, because some laws are what Augustine would call unjust laws. And the prophet, the preacher, the black theologian and African Augustine said an unjust law is no law at all. What you saying, preacher? I'm saying just because something is legal does not make it godly. So although Joseph knows that the law is written in a certain way and Joseph wants to obey the law, he doesn't believe God will have him do that at the expense of exposing somebody he loves to harm and danger. No, brothers, sisters, friends, and kin. Joseph does not allow his male privilege or his fragile ego to justify treating black women, I mean Mary, like they are objects and pieces of trash. And sometimes, you and I lean in because I feel something coming over me, sometimes we forfeit the larger and more liberating move of God because we don't want to have to pay the price of our ego and convenience. So we move impulsively, trying to alleviate any turmoil and tension. But sometimes, type that, sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes, old Jojo and Joseph, and some of us just don't get enough credit. See, he considered breaking off the engagement entirely. He was probably going to move into the friend zone on the low low. He was just going to unfollow her on Facebook. He wasn't going to block her on Instagram. He was just going to unfollow her or unfriend her. He was going to distance himself from her. But notice brothers, sisters, friends, and kin. Joseph does not move impulsively or immediately. That is honestly how he felt. I'm glad the text lets us in on his emotional situation and maybe it can coach some of us into some emotional maturity. Just because you feel like it don't mean you have to move on it. He's reflecting and considering and negotiating how much he wants to pay. And can I tell you one more time what still shouts me Joseph knew he was going to have to pay something. And he wanted to make sure that what he paid was not cheap or erroneous as an investment. So the word for us today through Joseph is that we have to always consider that God might be up to something new. Who am I preaching to? Go ahead, I need your hook to preach right here. God might be up to something bold. God might be doing something different and something unconventional that eyes have not seen. Yes, Lord, and ears have not heard and it has not even entered into the heart of certain people, but the fact is still that with God all things are possible. It's possible that God might be doing something so inconvenient and so unconventional in our individual lives and collective communities that it's gonna require a whole lot of our time, talent, and treasure. Maybe the reason the crime rate is what it is is because some of us re refuse to invest enough of our own time, talent, and treasure. Maybe the reason the economic inequity is what it is is because some of us just refuse to invest enough of our time, talent, and treasure. But Joseph knows, and we need to know, that God can make it happen. Joseph had to know this, because in the midst of this chaotic and calamitous circumstances, the scripture says he went to sleep. Yeah, he got some rest. He, he, he laid down. Uh, uh, he, he was thoughtful enough and tactful enough to reflect and deliberate and consider. And, and while he was deliberating and reflecting and considering that's when God showed up. Maybe God ain't quite showed up yet because you won't sit still enough. But, but, but Joseph is also instructive, as I said last week, because he doesn't just negotiate the price point. He acknowledges or he is knowledgeable about the prophetic particulars. This thing blessed me last week. I don't know if it blessed you. Maybe you'll talk about it in the sermon talk back period after the sermon. But this thing blesses, blessed me last week. That, that Joseph is knowledgeable about the prophetic particular. Y'all remember that passage that's talking about what the prophet had said? See, we, we must know the prophetic particulars if you're going to recognize it. And, and, and the reason some of us miss out on the mighty miraculous and militant moves of God 
is because we haven't spent enough time, talent, and treasure in the things of God to be able to know a move of God when it shows up. Some of us have been so cheap in what we've offered in the things of God that we wouldn't know a move of God if it slapped us in the face because we too busy playing church, too busy trying to use church and Christianity as a means of gaining some celebrity or social status, or too busy trying to, I know I'm finna hit you, I just ain't come to miss you either. Some of us too busy trying to find a way to make the minimum investment of our time, talent, and treasure. Maybe on the first and fourth Sundays. Maybe I'll watch the first few minutes. I'm not going to watch that whole 30 to 45 minute sermon, let alone that whole 45 to an hour long uh, 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 service. No, no, I'm not going to be watching the announcements and trying to catch up on all the things happening. No, no, I need to do the bare minimum. I'm not going to give uh, uh, an adequate or substantial or sufficient amount of my tithe or my offering. No, I'm going to give a little tip. A little $5 here, a little $10 there. I mean, because Pastor Earl got it. You know, the, the leadership team, they got it. Some of us have not experienced the full manifestation of God because we have been giving the bare minimum of our time, talent, and treasure because we don't think it's worth it. No, don't log off, lean in. Yeah, nigga, I'm talking to you. The Bible said the grass withers and the flowers fade. But the word of God stands forever. That means the investment is always worth it. The Bible says the word of God will never go out and return to us void. The, the, the scripture says the same God that begun a good work is faithful to see it to fruition. And maybe that won't catch you in your Ebo Shata or your Shashapo. Maybe that ain't black enough for you, so let me add some Africology to it. That's what our elders and venerable ancestors like Mahalia Jackson used to sing about when they said, you can't hurry God. <laughs> you just have to wait. You have to trust God and give him time no matter how long it takes. Huh? You can't hurry God. He's a God you can't hurry. Watch this. But he'll be there. Don't you worry. The songwriter said you can't hurry God and whenever God shows up he may not come when you want him but he's always on time. But you won't know that if you don't spend enough time talent and treasure in the things of God. Joseph knows about the prophetic promise because he has invested enough of his time, talent, and treasure into the temple worship of his community such that when this divine opportunity is thrust up on him, even though he was not expecting it, he's in tune enough with the voice of God. He's in tune enough and knowledgeable enough about God's track record such that he's not immediately or erroneously going to dismiss it because he wasn't expecting Expecting it. I'm trying to help somebody. Maybe if we invested more into the things of God, we would recognize those unconventional and inconvenient moves of God and not dismiss God because we're impatient. Joseph encounters a move of God that he doesn't initially like. That's in the text. It's way too inconvenient for his personal preference. But Joseph has enough knowledge, enough institutional and cultural and ancestral history, preach Earl Fisher, such that he understands that how God can move and how God might move is not always aligned with how God has moved, but God is never out of options. So Joseph considers that the move of God that is happening is not just about him and Mary, it's about the whole community. Some of us are ignorant of the prophetic particulars. We don't know what God has said. I know, I know, I know if you can't say amen and I say just say ouch. We don't know what God has said or how God tends to move because we haven't invested enough time, enough talent, and enough treasure in the places and the spaces where God teaches us about God's movements. And some of us don't believe that God can do exceedingly and abundantly above all we ask or think, but Joseph knew. Why, why am I saying all of this? I'm glad you asked. I'm about done. I'm saying this because the text says he was faithful to the law. See, the only way to be faithful is to be familiar enough with what you're about to be faithful to, to fulfill your faithful commitment. 
So when the scripture describes this prophetic promise that most of us have never read in Isaiah, it's not describing the promise to Joseph. It's describing the promise to those of us who are not as knowledgeable about the promise as Joseph is. The angel doesn't even introduce himself to Joseph. He won't be like, hey, Joseph, calm down, be easy, don't be afraid. It's me, Gabriel. It's me, Michael. It's me, fill in the blank. No. And that tells me that this wasn't the first time he had interaction with this angel. The angel simply tells Joseph what's going to happen in the immediacy of the moment. This means even though Joseph is technically about to break the law, he knows that God will cover him through the civil disobedience of the law because the manifestation of God's promise being fulfilled is more important than keeping an unjust law. I wish I had time. Because when God gives us a divine promise and we agree to the terms that God has allowed us to negotiate, y'all do know, at that point, it ain't just our name on it. God stamps God's own name on it. God puts God's own name on the line. And I wonder if I could sneak or preach in for just a second and ask, is there anybody on this stream today that can type and testify there's nothing that our God will not do to defend God's name? There's nothing our God will not do to protect God's name. In other words, brothers and sisters, friends, and kin, God will never make us pay more than God can pay us back. And that's why our elders and ancestors says you can't beat God giving no matter how hard you try. Good evening, Abyssinian. And may the Lord bless you real good, but let me land this plane where I intended to a couple weeks ago. I, I'm done now, but I, I, I gotta say lastly, this is to me, and I believe in the eyes of God, the most important point in the sermonic presentation. Because if we don't sit through patiently. The first two points, we'll never get to this one. Some folk who ain't catch episode one or two of this sermonic rendition ain't gonna fully understand what I'm about to say right now. Yes, we have to negotiate the terms of the prophetic promise. Yes, we must needs know the prophetic particulars, but, but, but can I close and hang my hat and land this plane when I say none of that will matter unless we do this last thing, because this last thing tests the true limits of our relationship with God. The last thing we have to do, and I want you to put this in the comment section as I close, we have to nourish our own prophetic witness. God, I feel something. The Bible says when Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded. Can I tell y'all, I ain't come here to close like this, but I feel some oil being poured on me right now. I need you to keep in mind that by the time we get to verse 24, <laughs> all Joseph has had is a dream. <laughs> no, not some long, detailed three to five year plan. Not some long, detailed 25 to 30 year project. No, all he had was a dream. <laughs> that, that there was no uh, 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 portfolio that he could lean into that would give him instructions on how to raise the black Messiah from the cradle to the grave. All he had was a dream. <laughs> No blueprint or what Biggie said, a step-by-step -step booklet for you to get your game on track, not your wig pushed back. I'm sorry, I felt that in my shasha bow. Just a dream. All he had was a word from God that was given to him in the quiet midnight moments of his life. And the scripture says he takes it as enough evidence to try God in public. Good evening, Abyssinian. May the Lord bless you real good, but can I help you before I take my seat and log off? God is looking for somebody. God is looking for some church body. 
that's willing to nourish and develop and nurture and cultivate and invest the time, talent, and treasure into the public display of our private divine encounters. Yeah, Isaiah might have done it. Yeah, Jeremiah might have done it. But now it's time for Joseph to do it. Our elders and ancestors said it this way, Mama may have and Papa may have, but God bless the child that has their own. In other words, brothers and sisters, we have to grow from talking about what we heard and reading about what we read into doing what we have done. So we cannot talk about what we heard and can't just talk about what we read, but sometimes you gotta talk about what you know. And we know that all things work together for the good of them that love God and are called according to God's purpose. We know this because we've learned how to act on what God has said in private out in public. I don't care how many sermons we've heard or seen on the stream. It doesn't matter how long we've been in church. It doesn't matter how many scriptures we can quote or share on social media. None of the negotiations that we have with God or knowledge that we've developed regarding God's prophetic promises matter if we don't act on it. I'm done. I'm done. I, I, I'm done. We, we, we just got to move beyond the perfunctory reflections and ideations into a prophetic witness that proves what we believe God said. When God has told us to do something, do it. And, and God is telling somebody right now that the thing you've been mulling over or delaying or procrastinating about, just do it. God told you to go get back in school, just do it. God told you to go to school, just do it. Do it. God said start the business, just do it. God said invest your time, your talent, and your treasure into Abyssinian, just do it. I know we don't have a step-by-step -step booklet. I know we don't have all the answers. You don't, I don't, none of us do, and neither did Joseph. But the scripture says when Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded. That, 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 that blesses me. Because it implies that the onus of his obedience is now in God's hands. Since he said yes to God. <laughs> Since he signed his name on the contract that he negotiated. Oh, now the power is in God's hands. Just a few years ago, in the midst of racial unrest and all manner of political controversy, Nike released a video with Colin Kaepernick. It was a voiceover of several people who defied the odds. And Cap was commentating. But I need to add a little Earlology to his commentary because this thing shouts me. Cap said, if people say your dreams are crazy, if they laugh at what you thought God could do, <laughs> good, <laughs> stay that way. <laughs> I feel it. <laughs> because what they fail to realize is Calling a dream crazy is not an insult. He said it's actually a compliment. Cap goes on to say, believe in something. Even if it means you have to invest or sacrifice everything. He said, don't ask if your dreams are crazy. You need to ask if your dreams are crazy enough. And then there's the statement and the Nike slogan that pops up on the screen to summarize the sentiment behind the whole video. It says, it's only crazy till you do it. So just do it. Good night, sweet children. May the Lord bless you real good. I feel like preaching for a second because I stopped by to testify and tell somebody and I need your help to preach that the best things that God does might seem crazy until we're crazy enough to do it. Until we're crazy enough to act on that thing. And is there anybody watching that can type and testify? God will see it through. How you know preacher? I'm glad you asked and I'm 
logging off because the ancestors told us, have you uh, any rivers that seem uncrossable? Have you any mountains you can't seem, seem to tunnel through? God specializes in things that seem impossible. God can do what no other power is able to do. Nourish your prophetic witness. Those things that God has shared with you in private that you know have been confirmed, live them out in public. That investment of your time, talent, and treasure is how you fulfill a prophetic promise. Pay the price. God help us to pay the price to fulfill your prophetic promise. Ashe and amen. So what did I tell y'all at the beginning of this service? Didn't I tell you that Pastor Earl was gonna come with that word? Uh, told you, warned you, I tried to set you up for it. Lady Denise, go on get that man his ice cream on today. He earned that, he earned that little bit of ice cream. But again, we wanna thank each and every one of you for signing in with us on this morning. Uh, we continue to do what we can to actually push this word of God out. And we want to just, just too, before we go, we wanted to remind you of the uh, several ways that you actually do have to give on this morning. Uh, so we do have that uh, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful cash app um, or way of giving on this morning. It, hopefully it'll be up on the screen as I'm talking. But um, let me see, for the cash app, you can go to dollar sign. Remember the dollar sign, it's very important. ABC Ministries, uh, the number one. Um, you can use that to actually send by Cash App. Uh, PayPal, we can of course use the church email address. That's gonna be ABC Ministries and the number one at gmail.com. Uh, we can also use Givelify, which is our newest way. Just want, you know, just show y'all how we've been setting up and making everything, you know, technologically uh, uh, um, easier for you to do stuff. But of course, you can just find us on Givelify with the um, name Abyssinian Missionary Baptist Church. And of course, the classic way, if you want to mail in uh, your tithes and offering, that's going to be P.O. Box 9715. That's Memphis, Tennessee, 38190. All right. So again, thank you for signing in with us this morning. Um, just be reminded that you are loved. God loves you. We love you. We hope to see you all back in the church uh, on watch night if you feel comfortable. If not, you can always tune into the live stream. And just remember that, again, we love you. Pray for, pray for each other. Support each other. Pray for us here at Abyssinian Missionary Baptist Church. And just love on each other. Build each other up. All right. You all take God and have a great week this week.